Essie, uh, tell me about your name. What does S-E stand for? It stands for Sarah Elizabeth. And have you always been Essie, or were you ever Sarah, or what? Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm still Sarah. My, I don't make my parents call me Essie. Um, but ever since I had a a byline, um, I've been Essie. It's, I guess it started in college, probably 10, 12, 13 years ago. And, and why why Essie instead of Sarah Cup or Sarah Elizabeth as a byline? I think I had I think I had this notion that being gender anonymous was somehow I don't know either a, a cool or a smart thing to do. Um, I, you know, I, again, no, like no real particular reason, but I, I kind of wanted a little anonymity when I was writing, and not because I was writing on anything particularly scandalous. Um, I did mostly art history reviews for the paper, but um, it just stuck. And then, of course, when I started sending resumes out, you know, my bylines all said Essie Cup, so it was just how I, how I went. Uh, I, I find, it, uh, find it really interesting because I know quite a few women do this. They, they use, they use a, a byline that is, uh, you can't tell, tell the sex of the person. Um, could you elaborate more on why that is? I mean, because female writers get treated differently, or what's this? What's? Could you just elaborate more? Well, I mean, I, you know, that certainly wasn't. You know, w when I did it again thirteen years ago, um, I don't really think I had a particularly salient um, reason for it. Um, but but female writers are treated a little differently um, in some good ways and some not so good ways. So you know, it's it's pointless for me at this point because I'm on television. So you know, no one no one uh, you know has any has any questions if they know me. Um, you know, as to my my gender at this point. Um, but I think you know, in the beginning, it did offer me a little cover. Um, you know, I, I would get Mr. Cup in a lot of emails, which was sort of funny and, and nice. But again, you know, I, when I started going on television, it was completely ruined. So it's, it's, it's kind of silly at this point, but it's just how it is. Uh, do you prefer the term gender or the term sex for men and women? Oh, I don't, I don't really... I don't really play, like, sexual politics that well, so it doesn't really matter to me at all. Can, can you tell by reading someone's work if they're male or female? No, sometimes I can, and it's a game that I, I'm sure most writers do this when they read other people's work. I like to guess before I, before I know, and I can. And, I'm, in fact, I've read a number of studies sort of, you know, semiotic studies that have indicated that there are certain words and combination of words and, um, you know, conjugation patterns that, that do indicate um, whether the writer is, is female or male. But, um, again, you know, I don't, I don't really take my, my, my gender or the role that my gender plays too, too seriously in, in what I do. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, gosh. Um, well, Madonna at first, um, of course. And then I, I flirted with becoming um, a geologist. I really loved rocks. Um, and then I started taking ballet lessons and, and became a, a semi-professional classical ballet dancer with the Boston Ballet for about 10 years, and so during that period, I thought that that's what I would end up doing, and then uh, ended up going to college and figured I'd, I'd be a, a, an art critic, and um, we got really disillusioned with that idea pretty fast, and um, just settled on writing, because it was something I was, I was good at, just naturally. I didn't ever take a writing class, um, and I really enjoyed it. I found it really satisfying to formulate opinions in your head and craft them, you know, expertly on paper and, and then see them in print. I found that to be really gratifying. Where did you go, undergrad? 
I went to Cornell. And you majored in? Art history. Uh huh. Where were you in the social packing order in high school? Oh, you know, I went to a really strange, I went to a small, all-girls Catholic school uh, north of Boston, and my class was only like 63 people, so everyone knew everyone, um, and the lines, you know, the cliques were really blurred because you were in all of the same classes, and because it was a Catholic school, there was a lot of, you know, forced socializing projects, um, so I think, you know, I... I had some, some, what I would consider, you know, cool friends, and then probably what some would consider, you know, nerdy friends. Um, but I was also, like I said, really involved in, in ballet, so that was, that was my life. I mean, I would leave school early every day to go rehearse, and, you know, that was, that was really my social life. School was really kind of a, a means to an end. Has your has your role in 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 a in a social circle changed over the course of your life? I mean, are you the the organizer? Are you the observer? Are you the the class clown? Are you the resident intellectual? I want to put a pin a hat on you or something. Yeah, you know, I'd like to put I'd like to pin a hat on me as well. Um, but I, you know, I moved a lot as a kid, um, so I was always the new girl, the new girl. Um, I think I moved 11 times before high school. So, I, you know, I was, I was always sort of being watched and scrutinized and trying to make friends. Sometimes that went really well, and I made friends easily, and sometimes it went just horrendously wrong. Um, and, you know, th that was, of course, painful, but I'm sure everyone has those kinds of memories to a certain extent. I guess I got more comfortable with myself in, in college. Um, I was sort of done with, like, the, the all-girls stuff, so I, I really eschewed the sorority route in favor of just finding my, my good friends, and I found them pretty easily, and they're still my, you know, very close friends today. And it, I don't know. Socializing got a lot easier in college. Um, with, with guys, it got easier, and with girls, it seemed to get easier. Um, I don't know what you'd call me now. I'm not a person who has thousands of friends, um, despite what it says on Facebook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's promotional. Um, I am a person that has a very small circle of friends, and they're, you know, very important to me. And I've always found quality to be a lot more important than quantity, I guess. Do you bring people together? Do you, like, stand off to the side? I'm just picturing you at a, a uh, cocktail party of, you know, fellow intellectuals. I'm not quiet, so no. I'm not, like, shy. Um, but I'm not really a networker either. I don't enjoy networking, um, you know, and exchanging business cards and who do you know. And I, that, I really have, like, just no patience for that. Um but, I, you know, when I'm in a party, I'm, I'm pretty social, and I, you know, I like to talk to everyone, and I like to, you know, have interesting conversations. I think I'm, you know, a, a social person, I guess. <laughs> a, a social misanthrope, I'd, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> so what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad was a salesman until... Uh, just a few months ago, he retired. He worked for one company his, his whole life. It's Office Max. It used to be Boise Cascade. Um, selling office supplies. Um, he started in the warehouse and ended up being a, a senior vice president. So it was a, a really nice story, and I was really always very proud of him. Um, and my mother was a teacher who retired, I guess, when I was in high school. What subject did she teach? English. And where are you in the birth order? I'm an only child. What did your parents most want from you? Um, you know, I think they would say for me to be happy, which I, I certainly always felt. But there's also a certain expectation of being, you know, a moral person. You were raised Catholic. Yeah, I mean, 